E agora a gente tem a honra de ter um engenheiro do Twitter para contar a experiência de machine learning uh, deles usando o Lua. Hi everybody, I'm really grateful that I'm able to be here and speak uh, with you and also to hear all those really wonderful talks that have come before. So thanks for, for having me. Um, so I'd like to tell you about um, some work that we've done for machine learning tooling at Twitter uh, in Lua. Use it, uh, uh, it's in a project called Torch Autograd, and it makes writing neural networks or just really any kind of, or a broad classes of machine learning algorithms really, really easy to write, and we use it a ton at Twitter, both for prototyping and in production. So my name is Alex, I'm a research engineer in, it's kind of a new group at Twitter called the Advanced Tech Group, which is super generic, but we haven't really figured out exactly what we're working on quite yet, so we're working on lots of forward-looking projects that are about advanced technology. So uh, I'll tell you about one of these advanced technologies. Um, but first, uh, just to get everybody on the same page, um, what is machine learning? So I want to set this against kind of classic programming, which is what I do almost all the time anyway. Um, where what you do is you feed your operating system some code and some input, and you look for some output. And machine learning is kind of fits in this framework in the sense that what we're doing is feeding our operating system some data and a learning algorithm, and what comes out is code that we then run as normal. So instead of writing programs that have lots of rules in them, what we're doing is we're having a, another program learn those rules that we can then kind of uh, use later. So we're kind of gardening programs as opposed to writing them ourselves. So machine learning is all about building programs that build programs. And so in the context of other fields, what is machine learning? So it's at the intersection of artificial intelligence. Some people um, think machine learning and artificial intelligence are synonymous, but in fact AI is a kind of an older field. Um, well, machine learning is kind of currently the dominant subfield of AI, but um, they both have a lot of history. Um, people from stats and statistics say, well, you know, under the hood, machine learning is really just statistics, which is largely true, um, but uh, machine learning tends to be more empirically focused, so statistics is kind of an, a branch of applied mathematics, mostly. So machine learning is kind of uh, the intersection of all three of these, including computer engineering, so AI, stats, and engineering. Um, so it kind of sits right there. And what is deep learning, which is, I'm going to tell you, a tool that we kind of primarily use for deep learning. Deep learning is a uh, subfield inside of machine learning. Um, the ideas are really not new. It's a rebranding of about a half century old idea uh, called neural networks or artificial neural networks. Um, not to be confused with anything that actually resembles a brain. They really do not. <laughs> it's a really nice marketing ploy, but um, uh, it, it, they're, they're, they're quite separate. So the ideas are really not new, but what is new is really, really fast hardware. So GPUs are really what unlocked kind of this new phase of a resurgence of neural networks. And also gigantic data sizes, and I think we heard a little bit about that earlier today. So ImageNet is a huge, gigantic data set. Uh, AlexNet, the kind of breakthrough performance in 2010 that really put neural networks back on the scene, uh, that was because of a giant data set and really, really fast GPUs. Uh, and these are only getting faster, and the data sets are only getting larger. So these algorithms are extremely data and compute hungry. Um, so in a sense, the deep learning is kind of a sport of kings. So the reason why these large industrial companies really care about it is because they have enormous data sets that really are sometimes impractical for people with single machines to deal with. Um, so that's why there's a huge investment in this because it's something that people at scale can actually play with and get some really big wins out of. But essentially, deep learning, when you boil it down, is just a really scalable regression. It's not super fancy on the inside. It just works on bigger data, but it, it costs more to do so. Um, so for deep learning at Twitter, uh, everything that we do that has to do with deep learning is written in Lua. So that's stuff that's running in production, that's prototyping. That, um, every image and Periscope, which is our live video platform, and I believe tweets um, go through uh, our deep learning stack. And so Lua touches literally everything on Twitter. Um, there's a team uh, that ATG split off of called Twitter Cortex, which, and they're really driving this. They're kind of the applied machine learning research group at Twitter. So, you know, if something important in the world is happening, somebody is almost certainly tweeting about it. And tweets aren't just text anymore. Um, they're images, they're links, they're where you are, they're potentially live video that's occurring, and they're the, embedded in the conversations that are they're kind of threaded inside of. And our goal is across all this media to protect people on Twitter, so to hide offensive content or abusive content, uh, and to understand what exactly you, it is that you want to see. You might not be following somebody that you, you might enjoy. Um, and also to surface interesting and relevant content, right? So to bring you new people, to bring you new tweets. 
Um, and this is kind of a, like a cartoon view of uh, some of the models that we're using. So I'm going to use this cartoon here as like, here's my neural network, and we'll get into exactly how this works and like how we build these in a couple slides. So um, the overall kind of setup is we have some input, which here is some text, and we pass it through this, you know, deep learning model. It's kind of just magic goo at this point. Um, and out we uh, have some decision, like, is this an abusive tweet or is it not abusive? And someone is just saying, hey, I hope things are nice, so it's not abusive, right? Um, uh, and so we're always trying to filter um, abusive content on Twitter. Um, and we also do the same for images. So, you know, here's a picture of a pig with boots on. Uh, we pass it through our, you know, big deep learning stack, and we discover that it's not a naked person, and so we can show it to you, right? So these are, this is actually turns out to be very, very crucial to a positive experience on Twitter. Um, uh, another uh, aspect that we, we try to tackle is content relevance. So given some text that we might show you, uh, and given who you are, what you follow, and what you've tweeted before, um, we try to take all that information and decide whether or not you're going to like that. And like engaging with it, so liking it or favoriting it or retweeting it, it's kind of a proxy for do you like this, right? So we're trying to predict this on an immense amount of text. Um, so how, how do these things actually get constructed, right? So um, about six years ago, um, the idea is that we'll be constructing these kinds of deep neural nets out of these big blocks, these Legos, that we can click into each other. So if you've heard of this idea of a, you know, a multi-layered neural network, the idea is that we're kind of having these deep stacked blocks of identical architecture. Um, that's exactly what was kind of going on at this point. Um, and the way that you actually program these things is usually with configuration files, right? Which, as I understand, is kind of like part of the history of Lua is, is doing that more expressively. Um, so you'd say, hey, I want a fully connected layer, which might be this guy, and then I want another fully connected layer, which might be this guy, and then I say, I would like some output at the very end, which might be this guy. So configuration files are not flexible, and if the blocks that you have to work with aren't the ones that you want to use, you have to go inside of the program that's reading this config file and create your own new block to create a new network architecture. Right, so it's extremely rigid. The actual model of how these things are strung together is totally hidden from you, so you don't actually get to have any kind of insight into how these things are working. And how this actually learns from data is also completely hidden from you. And kind of, uh, and here's like the blocks that you might have access to. And about now, and so this is Torch, the neural network package in Torch, which is kind of the predecessor to the, the project that I'm gonna show you in a moment. Um, and we saw a little bit of earlier today. Torch is effectively in the same spirit as the previous kind of config file based approach um, where you can grab modules and then add them together in a straight line. There are a lot of extra affordances that are kind of a part of the, kind of the modern neural net package in Torch that, don't, that are better than what came before, but you're still kind of attaching big blocks together. And if you need a new block, you know, you don't get to take advantage of all the, you know, nice, you know, calculus that the developers did for you and like figuring out how this works. You have to go back down there and dive in and do a lot of hard work in order to extend this in any way. Right. Um, so how, how do these things actually get constructed, right? So if we take away this DSL, this domain specific language that's letting us put together these large blocks, we actually want to understand what's going on on the inside. Um, there's really three main parts that go into constructing one of these models. Um, so the first is you need to be able to make a prediction, right? So that is, given an image, I want to do stuff to that image to get out, in this case, four numbers, which is the probability that it's a cow, a horse, a dog, or a cat, right? So there's some kind of linear algebra that's going to occur there, um, and it might not be complicated, but that's what I've got to do to make a prediction. And then what I need is a, a measure of goodness, Right, so what I mean by this is a single number that tells me, oh, I made a prediction, how far off is that from the truth? And then a, an update algorithm. So given uh, some measure of goodness, like how far off I was from the truth, I need to update each, one of the, each part of the model in order to have less error the next time around. Right? And I think we saw this before, there's uh, the forward phase, which is prediction, and there's this update phase, which people call backpropagation. Right? So here's torch code for doing the forward pass. Right. It's really not a lot of code in order to make a prediction with a neural network, right? So I'll grab this numeric library, Torch, which I hope some of you are familiar with. Um, I'll declare some uh, Torch tensors, right? So these are just, um, you know, n-dimensional arrays of numbers. Uh, so here's the weights of my neural network. Uh, this is kind of analogous to the filters that we saw earlier today. And then biases, which are kind of 
it's like a special version of, of the weights. Um, and in order to make a prediction, I'll just have this function neural network which takes in this parameters table, and let's say it takes in an image. Um, uh, this is all the algebra that's required to make a prediction. So I'm just gonna do a matrix multiply and addition, apply nonlinearity, do exactly the same thing again. And this kind of complicated looking thing is just how I transfer, basically how I get probabilities out of the last layer, right? So I can know what's the probability of this image of a cat or of a dog, right? So it's kind of squashes things into a nice range. Um, so that's the forward pass, or it's really not a lot of code. Um, and then I need some measure of goodness. I need to predict uh, how mismatched my prediction is from the true value. So what I showed you before is a cat, right? So the cat has probability one, everything else is probability zero. It's not half of a dog, it's definitely a cat. Um, and so I could just subtract the, the two probability vectors from each other and that could be my measure of goodness. There's a lot of different ways you could do this. So here's some code to do that, right? I might get my prediction and then I might say, you know, how far are these apart, right? Just get the squared error. Right. We usually call this uh, measure of goodness a loss function. Right? So that's just the term of art that we use. There's a lot of different ways of specifying this, but this is just a, a simple one. Um, now, it's the matching update algorithm. It's how we uh, get uh, updates to these parameters that make sense, that can take some thinking. Right? It's kind of, you have to do some calculus in order to write a new function. So here's some function I wrote after doing some math. Right? And it takes in the parameters, the image, and also this true label. Um, and it gives me something called gradients. Right? And so the gradients are the updates that I'm going to apply to my parameters in order to have my neural network make better predictions. And the way that you tend to apply these gradients is you say, I'm going to scale them down a little bit, and I'm going to shift my parameters in this direction. Right? So this is basically saying, how should I update my parameters so that I get less error? Getting these is kind of boring and error prone and kind of difficult and slow you down because you have to do a bunch of math and then you have to check that math and uh, it's always mechanical. You're just applying kind of mechanical uh, uh, calculus rules to the code that you've already written. Um, so fortunately the developers of every neural network library have done this work for you. So if you're using Torch or if you're using TensorFlow, you don't have to do any of that as long as you use all the functions that they've provided you, right? So if you need to make a network that looks like networks other people have made before, you're great, you don't have to do any work, right? So if you never stay off the beaten path, you don't have to kind of go away from programming and into like writing down calculus, you can just stay in programming mode. But if you wanna build anything that isn't in their library, if you wanna do anything that's like not included in their like walled garden, uh, you have to kind of become a developer and take on a whole lot of responsibilities in your, in your development activities in order to kind of reach the goals that you have. And the challenge that we have is we often have to go through many architectures quickly and in a kind of a trial and error uh, manner uh, in order to um, get some good performance on the task that we're working on, whether or not it's abuse prediction or it's discovering what content is in an image or whether or not you'll like a tweet. Um, and so we even have to invent some architectures sometimes if we get a hint that we might need to like do something completely new. So the kind of steps that we go through in creating these neural networks are, you know, first we gather a bunch of data and that's something that we're pretty good at. Um, and two, we think of a machine learning model for the data. So it might not be this kind of cartoony feed forward, like simple model, it might be something pretty crazy depending on what the task is. So for instance, for modeling video, uh, there's really no solution. There's a lot of different ways to do that. And we've tried a lot of different approaches to that. Uh, and some approaches work better for some prediction tasks than others, right? There's not a simple prescribed recipe for how to do certain tasks. Um, and step three, once we've got our idea, we do a bunch of math in order to get these kind of update rules. Uh, and then we code up the model in Torch and Lua. And then we've got to test our math to make sure that everything's correct. Uh, and then we train and test on the data, right? And if it does poorly, we go back to step two and kind of think of something new again, right? Problem is that this is really time consuming. Uh, and uh, it's also mechanical. It's, it's just applying very, very simple rules to uh, the ideas that we've come up with, right? So the, so the solution uh, is a project called Autograd. And it basically eliminates steps three and five. So you can just think up something, write down the numeric code, and you know you'll be able to get correct gradient updates out of it, right? So here's what this looks like. Um, so I've shown you everything up to here so far, right? So here's the, our neural network and the loss function that we've defined. I've only split these two functions for clarity. And this is the API of Autograd, right? So it, it's a function that will take in a function and give you back another function. So it's a higher order function. 
Um, so you give it the loss function, and it says, hey, I will give you a function that won't compute the loss. It will compute the gradient of the loss with respect to these parameters, to, with respect to the first argument. All right, so this is immensely powerful. I mean, if you call grad on something that's complicated here, you could have just short-circuited weeks of effort, right? Not just, you know, in terms of writing the code, but in terms of verifying its correctness. This is doing mechanically everything that you would do mathematically. And there's a, there's a name for this, it's called automatic differentiation, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about that in the end. And this is how you actually apply the update rules here, right? So for each data point that you have in your data set, let me get my gradients uh, with, of the loss with respect to the parameters, and then update my parameters. And this is, if you, you know, implement your data set function, this is, this is code that will run and will train and will give you good performance depending on kind of what you want to do, right? So this is the entirety of a neural network. This is kind of deep learning on a slide. Um, so, What's actually happening here? Like, how does this actually work? Um, so as torch code is run, um, when we wrap our function, what we're doing is we're tracking every operation that's occurring, right? So um, the first thing is, you know, I've declared my parameters and my inputs and my targets. Um, first, I'll multiply them, and then I'll add them, and then I'll subtract them, you know, square them, and then sum them. So what we're doing behind the scenes is actually keeping track of this entire compute graph, right? And the way that we do this is with operator overloading, and I won't get into the details, and this is kind of pseudocode, so this probably won't run, um, but the way we do it is we grab the original uh, function that we want to overload, and then we close over it. We kind of check if there's a special type, and if there's not, then we just return the original function. But if there is this special type, um, we'll unpack, it's, we'll just call it a node, we'll unpack the values in this node, and then call the original function on it, and then return this special node type back, right? So this is simplified. Um, there's a lot more kind of infrastructure around this internally. But the idea is we want to keep track of what function was run, and then what arguments were provided to that function, and then what the output value was. And as we gather these nodes along the progress of a computation, we're building a linked list that allows us to track the entire compute graph that we've seen before. Right, so this is kind of the data structure that we use to actually track the computation that's occurred. But then how do we actually get the update back? How do we get these gradients from this compute graph? Well, we have to kind of walk backwards. So the idea is, um, if I kind of multiply a matrix and a vector and then sum them, and I want the uh, gradient of this, this loss here with respect to the, the inputs, um, I know the partial derivatives of each of the primitive operations that uh, I've used. Right, so for every function in Torch, you can compute the partial derivative, and that's what we've kind of done behind the scenes, so you know, don't have to do that. Um, and we can calculate the partial derivatives at each step and propagate it all the way back to the parameters, right? And that's just the chain rule of calculus. Um, so that's, um, that operation is called automatic differentiation. Specifically, this is called um, reverse mode automatic differentiation. And in like the neural network literature, uh, you'll see they're called back propagation. Um, every single neural network library that you can download in any language depends on this idea. The difference is the implementation and some choices that they make. So under the hood, it's just the chain rule, and this is a, it's kind of controversial exactly who invented it, but it's been around for at least a half century. Um, and just two distinctions, automatic differentiation is not symbolic differentiation. The inputs of Autodiff is a runnable program, and its output is another runnable program. Symbolic differentiation takes in a mathematical expression and outputs a mathematical expression. And you also don't have any good complexity guarantees. So uh, calculating the symbolic derivative of a very complicated expression can blow up really easily. You actually have some theoretical guarantees with Autodiff that that will not happen. Um, and it's also not finite differences or numerical differentiation. Um, that has no stability guarantees, no numerical stability guarantees. Where, whereas Autodiff will produce a program that has exactly the same numerical stability as your input. So uh, when we've built this compute graph, uh, and we can, we can basically look up the partial derivatives all the way back down and propagate the gradients all the way back to the inputs. So we just have a giant lookup table of gradients, right? Or we can say, oh, we did a square root. Oh, here's the gradient of the square root with respect to the, with respect to the outputs, right? So it's just kind of this big kind of lookup table that we do. So this is, I've told you this is something that every neural network library implements. So what makes them different at all? Right? What makes them different is the granularity at which they implement this. 
Right? So for something simple like scikit-learn, uh, they basically don't give you any granularity at all. You get the whole model or you get nothing. Right? So you can't compose things. Right? Um, it was something like TorchNN or CUDA ConvNet or Lasagna. Uh, what you get is these big chunks of these layers. Right? And um, with full auto diff, you get every single element. And the composability is defined by what partial derivatives did the developers define. And what we've done in Autograd is defined all of them so that if you want to write any differentiable expression, any kind of neural network, you can use any function in Torch to do so and compose them together just like you were writing regular numeric code. Um, now, TensorFlow also does this, but we actually um, are different from that approach in the sense that you're still writing Lua code, you're still writing Torch code. You don't have to drop into some separate DSL that they've defined. And we're also doing all of this at runtime as opposed to ahead of time. And that allows you to do some pretty weird stuff. So you can actually, this is a function that could be a neural network and has some weird properties uh, that you ordinarily wouldn't be able to uh, differentiate through. So I'll just walk you through this briefly. Uh, we'll do some imports. Um, we'll define some parameters. And then here, I just I want you to note this n loops parameter is a random number from two to four. So it's, this is a random kind of aspect that we've added to our code here. And here's our function that we're going to want to differentiate. So we'll, for a random number of loops, um, we'll switch an if statement on the contents of a random matrix. Uh, and then, oops. And then uh, fill in a table based on that output. Um, otherwise, we'll do something else, and we'll sum the outputs here. So this is actually a really dynamic kind of compute graph that you couldn't actually define ahead of time. There's actually no neural network library which will let you do some dynamic stuff like this. Um, and also, there's zero compile time, uh, and so this is kind of instant gratification. Um, and so the practical consequences of this at Twitter is we try uh, some pretty crazy, like potentially high payoff stuff uh, a lot more often because Autograd makes it essentially free to try whatever idea that you have in kind of the deep learning or machine learning space. Um, and we actually use some weird stuff in production, uh, some loss functions that aren't just, you know, summing the difference of two vectors, but are in fact a loss over a tree structure, things that in order to actually get the gradients of those things, you have to sit and think pretty hard and you have to check them pretty thoroughly. Um, but we just wrote them and they just worked the first time. Um, and this whole kind of system is often kind of fast enough. Uh, there is a bit of a speed penalty because we're, we've written an interpreter that lives inside of Lua in order to do this kind of operation. Um, but there's no penalty at test time, right? Your code goes back to regular torch code as soon as you stop using Autograd. As soon as your weight matrices are trained and you load them in, Autograd doesn't even exist. It's just regular torch code at that point. Um, and I believe networks trained with Autograd um, are touching every piece of media that's running at Twitter. Um, so it's really seeing a lot of kind of use in production. And if you've used Twitter, you've in a sense used Autograd. Um, and on that note, you should be using it. I mean, just give it a try. It's super easy to, to, to use it. Um, in the vein of people making their own package managers, um, I've kind of packaged uh, Lua in, um, a, uh, in a project called Anaconda. Anaconda is the like, Python de facto standard for scientific computing. So a lot of people kind of in my data science and machine learning world uh, already use this package manager. And so what I've done is enabled it to be compatible with Lua. And so if you've got Anaconda installed, um, you can use Lua and Lua rocks and all this stuff and Torch and Autograd with just a line of, of install. So uh, it's just two lines to uh, install Conda. Um, and then you can change your path if you want. And then installing uh, Lua and then this Lua Science package, which is like a meta package with about 60 packages inside of it, um, is just one line. And I have um, LuaJIT and uh, three versions of um, Lua 5.x. Um, and uh, this kind of installs instantly. Um, so if there's any questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. But that's all I've got. Uh, you mentioned that your community is very used to Python. Uh, what brought you to Lua instead of Python for Torch? So the, um, the, the data science community is pretty heavily a Python community. The deep learning community, I would say, is I don't know the split, but it feels like 50-50 between Lua and Python. Um, it used to be 
uh, I think, a bit more biased in terms of Lua. And then TensorFlow, as that came out, um, Google has invested a lot of kind of community outreach efforts. I think the balance is tilting a bit. But every new paper that comes out with some cutting edge new cool model, um, within a week, there's usually both a Torch implementation and a TensorFlow implementation. Um, in terms of why we use Lua, um, are the kind of the CTO kind of of our group called Twitter Cortex. Uh, Clement Farabe is one of the original, he's, he made Torch. Uh, and so he kind of, as he came into Twitter and brought deep learning to Twitter, he said, guess what, we're using, this is what we're doing. So it was a fiat, <laughs> right? He just decided that that was uh, what needed to be done. And in actually in terms of why he uses Lua, I th he's, um, he's got a pretty diverse kind of engineering background and in his graduate career, he was doing deep learning on embedded devices, right? So he had like a thing on his helmet and you could drive around with a bike and it would identify every object in the scene at like live. Uh, he tried to do that in Python, and as you can imagine, he became quite frustrated quite quickly, and that's when he discovered this great language for doing embedded stuff called Lua. Um, and that was kind of the birth of Torch. Does Torch run on embedded devices? I think so. I mean, it runs on mobile devices for sure, um, but uh, that's kind of the origin story as far as I, as far as I know it. Oh, hi. Uh, you mentioned that every time the, the at, at its core, Autograd is basically a lookup table for the derivatives of every single Torch function or or math function. Does that mean that every time that Torch is, uh, that comes out a new Torch version, you have to update this table? And if I like create my own models, can I have access to this lookup table to uh, add my own derivatives? Yeah, definitely. So um, at its core. Uh, Autograd uses the lookup table in a kind of an interpreter process as it goes backwards this compute graph. Um, we have gradients defined for every torch function, I believe every torch function that is differentiable. Um, the torch core set of functions are not changing very quickly. It's stuff that's like like BLAS and like LAPAC. Um, and then like max and min and all just like basic stuff that really isn't going to change very quickly. Um, however, if you have some new numeric function, and we actually have some utilities, right, sort of like commonly reused utilities, um, you can define your own gradients. It's just like a, uh, it's a wrapper that costs maybe three lines of code around the actual gradient definition. Um, and people do use that um, a lot. So if you have some external numeric function that does like signal processing and you know it's gradient, you want to use that in a neural network, super easy. And then we'd love pull requests if, if like you, uh, you know, want to, if you, if you do something like that. Nice, thanks. Uh, hi. Uh, you intercepted it? <laughs> no, I did, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, frequently you can uh, compute both the function value and the gradient at the same time uh, more efficiently than computing them separately. Uh, do we do that? We have to get the forward value in order to get the backwards value. And I didn't show it here, but we actually re will return both. Um, so a backwards pass or updating the neural network involves going both forward to make a prediction and then using that prediction to make updates all the way back. So any update to a nor neural network will be at least twice the cost of, of the forward pass because you've got to okay. do that as well. Okay, thank you. I think there's a guarantee that reverse mode autodiff gives you, which is, let me get this wrong, but uh, it will not cost you more than four times the number of operations of the forward pass. Um, but I don't remember the details of that proof. More questions? How do you pronounce your surname? Wilchko. There's six consonants in a row, so it's very legitimate to not know how to pronounce that. It's my telemarketer filter. Is Mr. Wolschkonchko there? No, no, he's not. There's nobody by that name. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> what, what about the output is being used in production? So if there's an abusive uh, tweet, what happens with it? Is it delivered or is uh, forbidden of being tweeted in the first place? Um, so I don't know the state of this in production. Um, I can tell, I, can, I know it for images. So if there's an image that's flagged as abusive, um, we'll say there's like a, a blur or like a screen that goes over it and says, we think this isn't something you want to see. Click if you do want to see it. Um, but we don't, as a point, we do not delete anything from the platform. Mm -hmm. um, everybody can say whatever they want, just some people might not want to hear it. <laughs> More questions? Okay.
Okay, um, please a round of applause to Alex.